Hi everyone, this is Dr. Josh Phillips and we are getting into some of the first lectures for my spring 2021 courses. Today we are in uh, CAS 303, which is communication theory. Uh, so right now today, uh, I'm going to try, it didn't work so well in the fall, but I'm going to try to keep all of these uh, YouTube videos between 20 and 30 minutes. Um, just to, I, I know that the, the screen time starts to wear on people. Um, so with that, uh, we're going to lay a, just a very basic foundation for how communication works today. Uh, communication, uh, if we think about it in terms of language, uh, it's something that we sort of naturally pick up on from in a, in a very young age. So it's something that we feel as if we had our entire life. We almost learn language before we have an active memory of anything that else happened in our life. Um, and so because it's always been with us throughout our life, it's something that we rarely think about with regard to what is its function? How does it work? Um, when language is used, how does that make me feel? How does it make me move through the world? So we're going to kind of go over some of those concepts today in this uh, hopefully uh, brief lesson. All right, if I can stick to a good time frame here. So to begin thinking about communication uh, with regard to language, uh, we're actually going to go back a little bit. We're going to think about language with regard to artwork. All right. So uh, this gentleman here uh, is named Francisco de Goya, and he was a Spanish painter. Um, as you see, he lived between 1746 and 1828. Um, he was a court painter, so he was painting royal families. So here's a picture of uh, Charles IV um, and his family. Uh, and then down here, there's a painting called uh, La Maja Desnuda, which this nude portrait of a woman, right? So you can see he's a very sort of classically trained Renaissance painter, uh, well known throughout Spain. Again, he has access to royalty as far as painting portraits, family pictures, etc. However, later in his life, uh, Francisco de Goya went through this sort of very uh, recluse existence. Uh, so later in his life, uh, just as he started to creep into his 70s, he ended up buying this two-story house, um, and he was basically a shut-in until the day he died. Once he died, they opened up his home, and they found that there were these sort of 14 murals painted onto the wall. All right, they weren't paintings on canvas that he had hung, but he actually just started to paint all of what are now referred to as the black paintings, these sort of very dark um images of uh, of life and events of war of torment um, these murals were painted all over his wall uh, because he was such a well-known uh, painter in Spain people wanted to keep these they're also you know very intriguing very interesting uh, some of them are somewhat disturbing as a as we have a picture of here uh, with, with Saturn devouring son, his son we'll talk about this in a moment um, so they wanted to keep them so what uh, they had to do is they had to go in they actually had to sort of cut the paintings um, out of the plaster of his house, uh, sort of trim up the Im uh, images, frame them up, and now they are hung in the Prado, uh, which is a sort of national museum in, in Madrid, Spain. Um, so we get to a couple questions with regard to what is he trying to communicate later in his life, right? He goes from this sort of very classically trained artist who's painting realistic portraits of royalty, um, and then he has this I, I, I hesitate to call it a decline, uh, but he definitely has this sort of change in mood uh, with regard to his outlook on life. And because he was a recluse in his later, uh, in his later years, we can only sort of guess at, at what was going on in his head um, as far as why he turned from a classical painting to things that um, are, are still realistic, right? This isn't an abstract painting here. Uh, we can definitely sort of tell that it's this sort of like human form. Um, but it was definitely sort of less realistic, all right? Uh, and so you start to say, well, what is he trying to communicate? As he creeps into his 70s, as he's, you know, near the end of his life, what sort of things is he trying to comment on? People have said, you know, he just started to have this sort of, um, the, these dark real, uh, realizations about life. Um, he was concerned about just Spain in general, about the world. Uh, you know, you kind of fall into this nihilistic spiral of, you know, what matters, did anything that I, that I did, did any of that matter? You know, if I'm just going to die and it's all going to, you know, burn anyways, like what's the point of, you know, and, you know, you're sort of like losing your faith in, in what's the point of, 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 of living or creating things that are beautiful. Um, it starts to sort of go down this, this path, all right? So one of these paintings 
uh, that he performs is a rendition of uh, a very well-known um, story out of Rome, uh, ancient Rome, right? Saturn devouring his son. So we have the, the the Roman god Saturn here, and this is, you know, in his hand, he is holding his child, right? And he's physically eating his child. So you have this question of like, what is this trying to communicate? All right. So this this is a known story uh, out of out of Rome, right? And then multiple artists have depicted it on the canvas, have, de have depicted this story on the canvas. So you say, okay, what is the artist, what is the story trying to communicate here? All right. And if you sort of read into the story, you read interpretations of the story, what this story is, is uh, about is about fatherly figures or just old individuals in general being jealous and envious of the youth, right? Um, we can think about this in terms of today's, uh, you know, you might, you might have experienced this as you were growing up. Um, you have those overzealous dads at t-ball games, um, at football games. Uh, those dads who just didn't quite, you know, make it. Um, and then all of a sudden they're sort of putting all of their energy and emphasis into their children. Um, there are two famous plays that sort of have similar stories. So uh, one of the plays that we read in one of my classes is Death of a Salesman with Willie Loman, right? This salesman who's constantly going around. He puts a lot of pressure on his kids to do well because he's sort of real, he's starting to realize that his life isn't turning out the way he wanted to. And now that he's near the end, he sort of envies the opportunities that youth allowed him. Uh, there's this famous quote. It's been attributed to a few different people, so I don't know the exact source. But a famous quote is that youth is wasted on the young. Right? So when you are young and you, know, you, you don't realize the advantage that youth has until you get older and then you realize I missed all these opportunities. Right? But this is a common story throughout thousands of years of human history. Um, of the other famous um, play, so you have Death of a Salesman as a play, Arthur Miller, um, and then you have the play Fences, which was made into a movie with Denzel Washington uh, a few years ago, but it's a, it's a similar story. Now, Fences has um, a, a bit of a uh, plot twist theme with regard to the, the racial dynamics, so Denzel Washington's character um, not only wasn't making it as far as his professional he he was pursuing this. He was a he was a very good baseball player, and now his son is this really good football player. But Denzel Washington didn't make it as a professional baseball player, and part of the story that's lumped into that is also um, ideas of of racism in the, in early 20th century America and the opportunities that would have been offered to um, black athletes. Um, but the but the, uh, the the story in Death of a Salesman, the story in Fences, are very similar with these father son dynamics. All right. And so as we see Francisco de Goya get older, and he is painting these more sort of darker images uh, of the, the, the tragedy of human existence, um, one of the paintings of the 14 is Saturn devouring sun. So we might, you know, think that de Goya had a choice as far as what stories he wanted to tell when he was older. He only painted 14 things. And the fact that one of the stories that he decided to paint was Saturn devouring his son. What was, uh, what's the story in general trying to communicate? And then what might de Goya be trying to communicate to all of us? And again, we don't know exactly because you know he died and then later they open up his house and they find all these paintings after he's gone. So we don't, you know, he didn't write down like this is why I painted it. But we can start to guess, okay, he, only, he had an option to paint any picture he wanted and he paints this picture. There's probably something there that is a common theme within human history of the older generation being jealous, being envious of the younger generation with regard to the usefulness, the opportunities ahead of those individuals. Um, and the older generation might, looking back, uh, might be looking back and having some regrets about some of the opportunities that they didn't take that are now afforded to the younger generation. Um, and so this is one of the many paintings that Dogoya has. And you can, if, there's a whole, you know, there's a Wikipedia um, entry for just Dogoya's black paintings if you want to kind of go through all of them. All right. So this is one of the functions of communication. All right. I have information. I'm trying to communicate with you. One of the ways that painters do it is through paintings. Another way we can do it is obviously through language. So um, language, right? Uh, uh, humans are... Um, symbol using animals, right, which is a, a common 
um, which is a, a common phrase in, in this rhetorical tradition that we're in. And one of the things that we want to know with regard to symbols is that sort of on their own, letters and sounds are completely abstract and meaningless. Right? When people started to sort of first develop language, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, you could have made any sound out of your mouth that you wanted, and you could have attached that sound to any object, right? But we attach specific sounds to specific objects, and that's what gives it meaning, right? And one of the ways that we kind of, can kind of think about this is that uh, is through the, the use of uh, languages that are foreign to us, all right? So if I use the word mother in English, right, I know that the word mother is attached to biological female who... Um, has children, and it's the relationship between the child, right, between the, the younger person and the older person with regard to biology, right, and caregiving, right? Mother is a different sound, right? Don't think of it as a word at the moment. Think of it as a mother is a different sound coming out of somebody's mouth in different languages all around the world. Now, there could have been any sound that came out of a person's mouth to attach the meaning of biological female who has child, and then there's this connection and relationship between those two individuals. That could have been any sound, but in the English language, we decided to make that sound mother, all right? So this is what we're looking at with regard to how language is created and evolved, uh, and with regard to this idea that, you know, letters and sounds on their own are just abstract. And it's the combination that we put them in, and then not only just the combination, but the meanings that we attach to those letters and those sounds. So there's three ideas you need to know here. This will all be on the test, all right? The signifier is the word, right? The signifier, the thing that is signifying the object. The signified is the object, all right? So that which is being signified, all right? The sign, I like to think about the sign uh, as, as sort of all of the additional baggage and emotions and ideas that come with with, that come with understanding, connecting that word to that object, right? So if I say the word mother, right? So mother, we can think of it as, you know, biological female who has had children, right? And then there's, you know, but the, the, but the sign is we have all these sort of additional things with regard to caregiving and upbringing and the special bond between mother and child, right? That's all this additional emotional ideas that flood into us when we hear the word mother. When we hear mother, we don't just think the sort of like abstract, um, stoic object of like biological female, you know, mechanism, you know, that, that produce children, right? When we hear mother, we think of a whole lot of additional information, all right? And that's what taking the word mother and connecting it to uh, the object that's what creates this sign for us, right? So when you say a sentence, um, you know, I like apples, right? I like apples is more than just those three words. We can understand those three words, right? I, right, this object, the word, the signifier, the letter I attached to me, right? Like, right, and apples, right? We know what, an, we know what a picture of an apple is and we attach the, the signifier, the word apple on, but we know that I like apples is more than just three words. Right, I, there's a whole lot more information about who I am as a person that you recognize. The idea of liking, right? Um, you like things, I like certain things, we dislike certain things. So we understand that there's, a, there's an emotion of, involved with the idea of likes and dislikes. Like is less than love, right? If I said I love apples, that'd be something different than I like apples, right? And apples, right? Apples is an entire category of food, Right, they come in all different shapes and colors and sizes. They have different tastes and textures, right? So I like apples is is a sentence that we get a lot more information out of than just three words, and that's what that whole sign aspect is, all right? So shared meaning between uh, people that is that's what creates communication. So what we're trying to do when we communicate essentially is I have an idea in my head, and I'm trying to get that idea into your head right, through what's called a medium. So right now it's this sort of um, oral tradition and it's also going through technology, so that's a medium. Now there's a way in which I could explain this chapter to you, to you through email or we could text message, right? That would be the medium. Um, you know, if I was very ambitious, I could, you know, paint a picture or write a song, 
all right? Uh, do an interpretive dance, all right? So the medium can change, but again, I have ideas about, you know, this chapter in this book, chapter one in the book. I have ideas. I'm trying to encode those ideas because I need to get ideas about this, about this chapter out of my head, and I need to get them into your head in a way in which you decode them the way in which I'm trying to express them, all right? Now, the medium can change. Now, again, one of the mediums right now that we're using is language, right, verbal, and the medium that we're choosing is to do it in English, right? Or at least I'm choosing to do it in English. There are ways in which I could take this medium and I could say, look, we can teach these lessons about signifiers, signified and signs. We can talk about Francisco de Goya. Um, we can talk about symbols. We're gonna get into abstract symbols and concrete symbols here in a second. We can do all that. And the medium I might choose is Spanish, right? But again, the idea is in my head. I need to get that idea into your head and if I know that we both share an understanding of the English language, that's probably the best medium to choose. If I gave this entire lecture in Spanish, that would be a, an, a, that would be an, a fine medium to choose, but you might not be able to decode it if you don't speak Spanish. For the record, I don't speak Spanish either. But, but that's kind of where we're at, all right? So I want to choose the best medium possible so that what I am trying to communicate with you, what I'm trying to encode, gets out of my head and into your head. All right. Okay. Um, if a word or sound doesn't communicate, or excuse me, if word sound don't communicate to someone else, they're meaningless. Right. So you, the communication is this sort of shared communal cultural experience. All right. It creates in groups and out groups. All right. Um, another idea here, right? There are no bad words. Um, I know that's a little bit. Um, it's a little bit watered down. Uh, it's a little bit too simplistic, but go with me for a second, right? Obviously, you can say, like, there are bad words, but just go with me for a second here. All right. If we say there are no bad words, but what we're really thinking about, you know, as far as, like, the sounds and combinations of letters, right? Again, sounds and combinations of letters are con completely abstract. They're just words, right? Um, they're just signifiers, excuse me, right? But w there are these bad ideas, and those bad ideas, right, these bad these bad ideas or these certain like bad objects, they get attached to this combination of words and sounds. And then all of a sudden we want to say, oh, we want to avoid saying those words or using those words in polite company, depending on what the word is in the context involved. All right. So if somebody has a bad idea or somebody has a, uh, let's go really extreme, like a bigoted thought, right? The, the sounds in and of themselves aren't bad, right? Um, the combination of letters aren't bad, right? Use the same alphabet to create the word love as you use to create awful, horrible, disgusting words, right? So the, the letters themselves aren't bad. The combination of letters aren't bad. But we start making certain combinations and we attach them to very bad ideas. And if I have an understanding that that word is bad and the, the community and the culture understand that that word should be avoided for different you know, contextual reasons, and if someone says that word, we look at them as if, you know, we don't want to be associated with them or we want to correct them or we need to have a discussion with them, right, depending on, you know, how they're saying it or why they're saying it, all right? One of the interesting ways to think about it, sometimes it's fun to do with, with friends as well, but it's, it's interesting. Um, so, for instance, I have a friend who is not um, an English-speaking native. Um, she's Spanish-speaking and she's from South America. English in South America is not as prevalent as English in, let's say, Europe. So um, English is more of a rare skill in, in South America, right? It's not prevalent everywhere. You, you, can, you can go to South America and start wandering around the streets, and um, you can be hard-pressed sometimes to find people who speak English, all right? You go to Europe and you walk around, everybody's speaking English for the most part, all right? Um, but a friend of mine... She started learning English in her 20s, and there are lots of very profane, nasty, ridiculous words that she says sometimes because she thinks it's funny and it's a joke, and she, does, she doesn't attach the, the meaning to them that native English speakers would attach the meaning to, right? She just sees them as these like weird noises coming out of her mouth. The same way if you, if you're a native English speaker, um, learn Spanish or learn Mandarin or learn German, right? You're just going to make these funny noises that come out of your face and you're not going to recognize that people who are native to that language attach 
awful, horrible, you know, ideas to those words, or those words are profane. To you, you're just like trying to make weird noises out of your mouth, right? Um, and you don't necessarily understand the context of how um, profane you might be sounding, all right? So there are no sort of bad words, and if we really sort of take words to its most um, uh, deconstructed idea, right? They're abstract noises, right? There's, there's aren't, there aren't bad noises that are coming out of your face. What we do is we start to combine those bad noises, we construct them and we say, that's a word, and we attach that word to a terrible idea. And now all of a sudden, it's like, avoid making that noise with your face, all right? Um, all right, uh, the, here's a little clip that I want you to watch. I'm gonna put this clip, it's from C-SPAN, which is sort of like the political TV station uh, that runs like, you know, Congress all day. Um, I'm gonna put the clip down below. Uh, it's an hour long discussion um, by this linguist from Columbia. I believe he's still at Columbia, uh, named John McWhorter. He's pretty well known. He's been on like, you know, CNN and interviewed on the news a lot. Um, he's written a lot of books. Uh, so there's an hour long discussion that he has, but I only want you to watch these uh, 12 minutes or so. Uh, but he came out with a book a couple years ago called Words on the Move. And what it is, um, it's about the evolution of language um, over the years. And I hope that this works good. There we go. All right. And what he talks about is that words evolve. And a couple of the interesting examples he gives um, are with regard to Shakespeare, which Shakespeare wrote 500 years ago. And he talks about why it is that Shakespeare is more difficult to read in the 21st century than it was 500 years ago. And it's not because people are more simple-minded now than they were back then. It's just that there's a few little words in Shakespeare here and there that have changed, their meanings have changed just enough to make the reading awkward. Um, an example of this you might be more familiar with if you're not familiar with Shakespeare is if you uh, went to church ever in your life, um, different churches use different Bibles. So if you went to a very old traditional church and they use the King James Bible, Bible with all the these and thous and thys, there are these little hiccups that happen and it's, it's, it's just muddled when you read it. It doesn't flow very nice, right? Now there's updated Bibles with regard to update it, to, to update the language, right? Like the New International Version. I know there's a Bible version out there called the Message, which just sort of tries to write and it doesn't even try to sort of translate. It just sort of says like I'm just we're just going to tell the story in a different way. Um, so they don't try to translate word for word. They just like here's the gist of the story that just reads a little bit easier because it's written in 21st century uh, language and prose. Um, and so this is what McWhorter's talking about in this book that he wrote called Words on the Move. He gives a lecture about it, watch the 12 minutes here, and he gives some really interesting examples with regard to words that have actually changed their definition. Um, they don't change their definition overnight, right? But when you start kind of looking back to, again, Shakespeare 500 years ago, it's like the words have changed just enough to make 500 year old writing hard to read, right? Um, you can go back to some of the, you know, the documents of America's founding, you know, 1776 stuff. That wasn't that long ago as far as language evolution, but there are plenty of like little words in the founding documents that are also these like little hiccups and you're like, I'm not sure if I'm interpreting this correctly because the words have changed a little bit. The definitions have changed a little bit, all right, throughout the, uh, throughout the time in, you know, the English speaking world, all right. Um, just a little caveat here. This so is one of the reasons why censorship doesn't work, right? Because words evolve, right? So I'm, a ve I'm very much against censorship, period, just as like a political position, right? I'm a, you know, communication guy, um, you know, have, you know, specialties in, in, in rhetorical analysis, uh, rhetorical theory. Um, censorship is kind of, it, it's pretty stupid and it's useless because, because words change. So if I tell you today that you can't use a certain word, What's going to happen, maybe not tomorrow, but eventually is people are going to evolve to create a new word to fill that gap for that bad word that you censored. So you can keep censoring words and saying you cannot use this word anymore um, as some sort of like legal punishment, right? Don't use this word anymore. Uh, but the thing is, is that if somebody has a idea and that idea is controversial or even if it's bigoted or it's a bad idea, 
people, what happens is people just evolve new words to sort of take over the place of that old word. All right. Um, so on a long enough time scale, you know, censorship uh, doesn't work because new words just evolve in the English language. And one of the ways we can see this is, you know, every year the uh, the dictionary, right, the people who are in charge of like the Merriam-Webster's dictionary, they add new words to the dictionary every year. Right? There are words we use today that were not, you know, in the public imagination 10, 20, 50 years ago. Right? So we're adding more words to the English dictionary every year um, because people sort of start to attach new ideas and concepts to, uh, or excuse me, start to attach new sounds to ideas and concepts that are kind of floating around out there, right? So over a long enough timeline, censorship doesn't work. Um, and it, and it, it's kind of useless, right? Words evolve. Um, and McCorder lays this out pretty well. So again, watch this, uh, just, just, just watch the 12 minutes if you're interested in watching the entire hour. Um, but, you know, he starts off in the beginning where he says, you know, if you take two groups of people who speak the exact same language and you segregate them right and put one of the groups over here on this like island where they have no contact with anybody else and you have this other group and they're just kind of in the larger world and they're interacting on you know right uh with the rest of the world etc he's like within 500 years those you know or 500 or a thousand years he's like those two groups of individuals they're gonna you know they're gonna come together they're not gonna be able to talk to each other right because the, the languages have changed that much right the words and the sounds that we attach to ideas will change so much. Now he does give a list. He's like certain words of about, there's, he said there's, I think he says there's about 500 words that don't really change, like articles, the, a, for, right? Maybe maybe mother and father, right? Uh, there's a handful of words, relatively small, about 500 words. They don't really change, but every other word changes and evolves, all right, over time. Okay, check that out. Uh, this is one of my favorite posters. Um, I saw this uh, when I was in Chicago several years ago, and then I um, found it somewhere on Google Image Search, right? Um, but this is for the Chicago Public Library. And what it says is A, right? So the letter A. A is the first letter of the alphabet. There are 25 more. The Chicago Public Library has all of them in some very interesting combinations. This is one of those things that is extremely fascinating. If you're up real late at night, hanging out with your friends, um, staring up at the stars at 2 a.m., uh, this is one of those like, wow, the universe is so big, this is so crazy, what does life even mean, kind of moments, right? So if we just think about the English language, I know there's, you know, there's plenty of other languages out there, but just think about the English language for a second. 26 letters, right? And if you're a person who doesn't speak a foreign language, which is the vast majority of uh, English speakers uh, in the United States, uh, you get 26 letters to articulate your entire life, right? For the 100 years, if you're lucky, right? The 100 years you're on this planet, all you get is access to, you get access to just 26 letters to communicate everything it is you need to communicate, right? All the stories you're going to tell, all the stories you're going to consume, right? So if you're reading books or watching Netflix, all the stories you consume, right? Um, every articulation that you have of, of love and friendship for other people, every articulation you have of, of hate and resentment towards other people, right? All you get in your toolbox of communication is 26 letters. And you got to figure out how to take those 26 letters, which doesn't seem like a lot, and put them into some sort of combination to make narrative sense of your life, right? This idea of narrative sense making, right, is what it's referred to as, all right? That's, that's what you get, that's all you get, all right, is 26 letters, you put those into some combinations and hopefully you can articulate everything it is you need to articulate. I'm trying to, I'm trying to articulate, you know, classes for all the students I will ever have. There are authors who are prolific, right, with regard to writing, they write 50, 100 books over their lifetime. They're trying to write, right, multiple ideas and all they have access to is 26 letters. You're trying to tell your best friend that you no longer like them and you hate them and you're resentful to them and you have to say mean, nasty things to them. You get 20, but then the next day you gotta go to your you know, boyfriend or girlfriend and confess your undying love to them, right? That's the same 26 letters to say all the hateful things you need to say and all the lovely things you need to say. You get the same 26 letters, right? And to consume the vast amount of information coming at us whether it's news, right? Fox News and MSNBC, they get the same amount of letters, but they are telling very different stories about our political landscape, right? All the books available in the library, the millions of books accessible to you through the Penn State Library system, they all just get 26 letters. And again, we're gonna narrow that to the English language. I know that other languages, they start to broaden out. They have a couple of extra letters here and there, or characters, depending on if you're going into, you know, Mandarin, for example, all right? But that's what it is, okay? That's all you get. And you just put them into combinations and you make slightly different noises with your face 
and all of a sudden you're communicating different things. Quickly, concrete symbols and abstract symbols just sort of know this. Um, concrete symbols represent something. Abstract symbols represent ideas. So the concrete symbol here, all right, as we look at that and we say, okay, that represents Twitter, right? If I make this little mark, right, you say, okay, you know, let me kind of broaden that out best I can. You might look at that and say, that's a swoosh, kind of a swoosh. I guess my my uh, drawing skills on this ain't too great, right? But you say, okay, that's a concrete symbol. It represents the company of Nike. Right. So you have these concrete symbols and they represent uh, they represent a thing. Abstract symbols represent ideas. So if you look at something like the American flag, the concrete symbol could just be America. You know, no emotional involvement. That's just, you know, that represents America. But the abstract symbol behind this American flag, you might think of all those, you know, Fourth of July stuff, you know, liberty, equality, justice for all, 1776, you know, all that kind of like. There's all these ideas behind looking at this flag that sort of give us additional feelings with regard to um, the ideas that that symbol represents. You might look at this Nike symbol and say, okay, it's a brand Nike, but then it represents this idea of like, just do it. And then you have all these images of like LeBron and Michael Jordan and, you know, every other athlete signed with Nike. All right. So that's what a concrete versus an abstract symbol is. And finally, the linear versus transactional model of communication. All right. The linear model of communication was the original one. And what it said is that there is a sender. We'll say that's me. I am sending you a message and you are the receiver. And that was really it. As we continue to explore this idea of communication, people said, no, 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 no. All right. The linear model is not sufficient. Communication is actually more of a transactional model. So you and I are both sender and receiver at the same time. So let's imagine that we're sitting in the classroom. I am sending you a message about chapter one and you are receiving that message. But if you're sitting in my classroom, even if you don't open your mouth, you are also sending me a message with regard to whether or not you are actually interpreting the material in the way that I want to. So if you're a student in my classroom and you're falling asleep and your eyes are glazed over or you're texting on your phone, you are sending me a message and I am receiving that message with regard to whether or not you're paying attention or whether or not my lesson is super boring. Based on that, I am going to change up the channel. The message is always the same. That's what you need to know. The message is always the same. I have to get you information about chapter one. That's the message. But I might change up the channel. So if my lecture's not working because your eyes are glazed over and you're sending me that message at your board, I might say, okay, we're going to stop the lecture and I'm going to put on a YouTube clip. Or we're going to stop the lecture and we're going to get into small groups. Right. Or we're going to stop the lecture and I'm going to have you free write, you know, some reflection question. All right. I still need you to understand chapter one. The message does not change, but I might need to change up the channel and the mode of communication in order for you to actually receive that message. All right. Now, also within the transactional model, just so you know, there are things known as ambient noise. So if we're in a classroom, we might hear the hum of the projector. There might be construction outside. Um, I have a couple sleeping dogs in the room right now. So if one of them starts barking, that's going to cause a distraction, right? You might have siblings or family members in another room. They're causing noise, right? That um, interrupts the way in which you are receiving this message, right? Um, and then finally, the field of experience or the context of the situation. So I need to get you information about chapter one. There's a student teacher relationship that does have this hierarchy to it that is different then if you and I are um, sort of uh, equal, sounds terrible. We are equals, right? As far as like legally speaking, right? Um, but if we're having a debate in the class, let's say we're having a debate over guns. Clearly, right? And people might want to say like, no, we're all equal, right? It's like an egalitarian classroom. At the end of the day, like if I'm assigning the grades, it's hard to argue that it's an egalitarian classroom, right? But if we're having a debate about guns in the classroom, even if I'm very generous to you, I still have the ability to control the conversation. I cannot call on you if I don't like your ideas. I can call on somebody else whose ideas I do like. All right, so I have the ability to facilitate the conversation. So that's the context of the situation. And that's going to change how the classroom argues or has a debate about, you know, gun control, gun violence, you know, Second Amendment, what have you. If you and I are just at a bar, right, as two citizens and I'm not your teacher, now we have an argument about guns and that changes the context. Right. I still have an opinion about guns that might be different than your opinion about guns. Right. 
but it changes the context because I don't have the ability to tell you, put your hand down, I'm going to call on somebody else, I'm facilitating the conversation. It's like, no, we both have an equal opportunity to shout over each other or to, to create some sort of rules where I go, then you go, right? This idea of turn taking, right? The context of the situation, whether it's teacher student, whether it's at a local bar, whether it's in some sort of debate hall, um, the context of the situation changes how the message is given and received. All right. So that's what you need to know about the transactional model is that we're both sender receiver. The channel can change. Right. It can be face to face. It can be over email. Um, we can do small group activities. Uh, I can have you do some writing as opposed to me lecturing. Right. The extra noise in the room causes distraction and the context, the field of experience, the context of the situation affects how you and I go about the communication. All right. So communication is far more than I send a message and you receive a message. It's a whole lot of other stuff. OK, that's chapter one. Uh, as far as just sort of understanding some of the basics of language and communication. And I will be back next time um, with chapter two.